Okay, so quick vlog post here. Um, vlog post commentary is kind of how I'm going to do this. Not so much a scripted post, not so much me like doing a, a traditional video essay on this. It's be more off the cuff. Uh, is this really the stuff that's been going off um, thinking about recently? And I want to address some concerns that I have had about my own backlog of material, stuff I've previously reviewed related to upcoming creative works that are coming out and whether I am going to be covering them or not. And also just related to other creatives going forward. So the topic of this video, if you didn't catch from the title card, is reviewing works from problematic creators. I'm about problematic cr things. And what kind of brought this on is I have been thinking for quite some time about the upcoming Netflix adaptation of Three Body Problem. If you've been watching this video for a while, you recall that I did a vlog-style review of Three Body Problem leading up to a world con in which the book was up for um, a Hugo Award for Best Novel. A Hugo Award that it won. And a Hugo Award which I voted for it for to win because I enjoyed that book a great deal. And I had been interested in watching off and on about the various efforts going forward to adapt this novel to a to the screen, whether film, television. Originally, it was their plans for a film, and that since progressed onwards to a Netflix original series. It's also I've been thinking about, for example, um, I like altered. I like the novel Alter, Altered Carbon. It turns out that the author of Altered Carbon. A book about people re-sleeving their consciousnesses into alter into different bodies um, turns out to have been a um, a transophobe, um, and also, of course, related to this is the Harry po is the current future of the Harry Potter franchise, which I am less deeply invested into as other creatives, um, and the issues with J.K. Rowling, who is also a raging transophobe. So, this is I'd be thinking a great deal about what's going on with uh, with reviewing works from people, creators who have said or endorsed create, um, problematic and, and bigoted points of view. And with an interesting thought he view here on particular for um, Sishin Yu, the, uh, Yu, the author of Three Body Problems. So, and how things get more complicated when it comes to his situation. Um, is it not something that's been explicitly stated by him or anyone who knows him, but it is a reasonable assumption to make if you've been paying attention to Chinese internal politics. So, let's back up a bit to my review of Three Body Problem. And there's going to be some spoilers here for the book. So if you're, going, if you're planning to go into the Netflix series cold, heads up. The book opens with a harsh view, harsh but valid and legitimate, and I would say in fact accurate view of the Chinese Cultural Revolution with a character who we later learn, and this is the spoiler, is the antagonist of the piece. Her father, who is a physicist, being murdered as a result of a struggle session within the uh, by a group of students in the Cultural Revolution were teaching physics because they have determined that physics is counter-revolutionary effectively because it wasn't started there in China. Um, that the, the variety of physics, of astrophysics, of relativity, and that sort of thing um, was not created in China and it was not created by a socialist, by a communist. And these events, along with the the repercussions that the protagonist, the, 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 the antagonist of the work faces, because of her father's background and in turn her own refusal to renounce the um, counter revolutionary dogma of physics, which I wish this was something I was making up. I wish this was something that was. Uh, hyperbolically created for the story, but no, um, is persecuted for that, and their career and potentially um, prospects are um, 
removed. They are barred from being in academia. They are sent out into basically the bush. And um, to be, uh, they're sent to a retraining farm and various other things. It's not, not going to recap the entire book here, but the point is, is the Cultural Revolution and a lot of other pro of similar doctrines and policies enacted by Mao's regime are depicted in the appropriately negative light. There's no whitewashing. There's no trying to paint this as, oh, it was, it was a good idea, but mis-executed by those underneath, by, by, by those at the ground level or anything like that. The revolution didn't fail. It was failed. That none of that crap is there. It's, it's painted as being an ill-conceived idea from the get-go. This was created before, I should mention, the current Chinese premiere. I'm going to look up his name to make sure that I pronounce it correctly, because I want to pronounce the names of people in these positions correctly. Um, so, in the title, I want the current. Okay, so given the current premiere, it's not actually the ruler. My apologies for the charge. Um, so I'm getting... Um, the second rank member, that's not who I'm thinking here. Who, who am I looking for right now? I'm sorry. Ji Xi Jinping. There we go. The General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. A president is the title. Is his title, not Premier. So Xi Jin, Jinping. My apologies for that mix up there. Anywho. Um... This is this book came out before he became president, uh, before he and his policies were put in place. And I bring up those policies because, much as Vladimir Putin's reign at this point is the appropriate term over Russia, has this government has taken steps to paint Joseph St Joseph Stalin in a more complementary light and to brush up and revitalize a little bit his cult of personality Xi Jinping has been doing some stuff from what I've by the account picked up for Mao and the other thing that his government has done is that the general stance they've taken when it comes to people in high-profile positions who are critical of the government or who, who are not, who are violating the laws is the wrong term, but basically, long story short, saying that if you're in a high-profile position that does not protect you from um, punishment for saying the wrong thing, that the government is much that if you are a very famous person, the government is not afraid to disappear you. Um, the disappear is the correct appropriate term here. A lot of times, happening is these people are then like again, just like going completely incommunicado. They're being taken from their home by authorities. Oftentimes, the only reason people know that they've been taken from their home by authorities is because people have seen them getting escorted into an unmarked white van or something similar, some other vehicle, and then they're just drop off the radar for weeks, months at a time, until eventually at some point they pop back up on the radar and issue a statement which sounds appropriately, appropriately as far as the Chinese government is concerned, um, apologetic and throwing themselves on the mercy of the government and all sorts of other things. And... After that, they generally tend to very strongly e echo the party line. 
they're not necess they're not people who are going to they're not going to say anything that contradicts the official stance of the Chinese government on anything in any way. And I from what I've picked up from bits and pieces of Chinese cultural news coverage and that sort of thing from an outside perspective is that that's led other people in similar fields in China in terms of actors and creatives and that sort of thing who are to be ones who are Chinese citizens and have family in the country to be similar to to do, to do likewise and everything getting locked down by COVID-19 is kind of put an additional bit on top of that and what does this come up and how does this relate to the body problem well I'll tell you Cixin Liu has said in interviews some very very nasty racist things about the Uyghur minority of China and in isolation that would that that on its own is horrifying and that's something like as it is I am not I would not purchase any additional works by the author I'm still not but context matters and so in the current context of how the Chinese government is treating its high profile people particularly when it's trying to paint the author of Three Body Problem as something of a cultural ambassador I can certainly see a situation where because the very spectacularly racist things he's saying are also the official stance of the Chinese government when it comes to the Uyghur, I can also see a situation where, I want to put this briefly, that the Chinese government effectively has a gun at his head. That even, that whether or not he actually believes these views is almost moot at this point. Because if he didn't believe them, he is in a position where he can't say otherwise. He's possibly even in a position where he couldn't even just say the bare minimum of I support of saying that he supports the Chinese government's um, actions in that area of China, and then refusing to answer further questions. That it's if it's not a full, full throated defense, then he's maybe in trouble. And I think all, the fact of his of a three-body problem is currently his highest profile international work being so critical of Mao and the cultural revolution to that extent probably isn't helping now that said I could be completely off base it turns out that he could, he could be actually in real life a um, spectacularly racist person and again it's not unreasonable we as I mentioned earlier the author of um, Altered Carbon and the related works in that series is also a spectacular transophobe in spite of the fact that the themes of the setting are actually kind of trans-friendly. So, by, contra then by contrast to that, you have J.K. Rowling, you have, you have um, the book right over there, Richard... Richard Morgan, and get the, I almost said Richard Corbin, who is an entirely different person, but Richard Morgan and J.K. Rowling, who are in the West and in countries where there is no governmental repercussions for saying anything nice about transgender people, who are in fact spectacularly raging transphobes, and who have and who have no real reason to be so. I will put it that way. No legitimate reason to be so. I like trans rights are human rights. I I I shouldn't need to have to sell tell you this, but I'm saying this that trans rights are human rights, and if you disagree, you can unsubscribe, and I will and you can unsubscribe. That's that's fine. So, by contrast, Rowling and Rowling and Morgan have no real excuse outside of actual bigotry. Tishin Liu could be going, I've been blinking twice to let you know there's a gun at my head. Why have you not noticed um, for, the, for the past several months um, since he's, or what have you, since he's made these statements initially? And that is... A, and so that's where things get complicated is in terms of when 
a person who is a citizen of a country who's doing a bigoted thing does not just uh, of a totalitarian country that is doing a bigoted thing um does not um and says statements endorsing the bigoted thing but in circumstances where criticizing the government can lead to significant repercussions that can lead to imprisonment, torture, and death, and possibly even death. But we don't know about that last one yet. So at least, very least, imprisonment and torture until they renounce, until they, um, renounce their earlier statements. I'm willing to cut a little bit of slack to the creative people in question. Not a lot of slack. And I'm not going to support their more recent works necessarily with financially. But I will cut them some personal slack, and I'm willing. And once they are in a position where they can safely renounce their statements, or otherwise say, "Actually, no, I said these remarks under duress. I, in reality, support trans rights, or I would have um, spoken out against the Uyghur if not just my life was in danger, or my danger about my family as well." Then I would. Then I, I will cut them some slack for those things. So, uh, it's when a creative is in a position where they are of no repercussions to, where they have no um, repercussions to their personal safety for saying the right thing. The government is not going to come after them for supporting again, trans rights, or what, or for saying that Black Lives Matter, or for support or those sorts of things. Then I have, then they have no excuse in my book for not doing so. By which I mean, if you endorse a hateful thing, if you say a bigoted thing, and you dedicate your financial resources towards serving, towards supporting that bigoted thing, then I'm not going to financially support you. This applies to J.K. Rowling. This applies to Orson Scott Card. This applies to Richard Morgan. And related to this, we have to talk about the mouse and the, the very large comic, the cartoony, the large cartoonishly stylized mouse in the room, Disney and Disney's Milan, Milan, with, on one hand, I want very much for films, for, for big budget films with Asian actors to do well. I want when major motion pictures are made with the financial backing of a studio like Disney, Warner Brothers, or um, Sony with Asian actors, or Chinese, Korean, um, Vietnamese, uh, Thai in leading roles. I want to support those works. I want them to do well because I want there to be successful. I, I want there to be, but for people who, for Asian people, when they go see a film, be able to go see a movie and see someone who looks like them on a film and go, yes, that. That person looks like me, and they're doing awesome stuff. Um, and by the way, props to the Fast and the Furious franchise for bringing back the care for bringing back their uh, big Asian character like uh, from the first movie. I uh, make sure it's. I am spacing names here. Um, let me hear my keyboard clicking because I make sure I've got this correct. Han, thank you. Props for them for bringing Han back um, after he was presumed killed at a point between um, the first movie and then uh, Tokyo Drift. Or rather say after Tokyo Drift. Um, but Fast and Furious timeline is weird. But anyway, the point is they brought back Han. They and with it they brought back his, they brought back the actor who played him, a Korean actor, which is awesome. Um, particularly since he is a character. Also, he's a he's a Korean act. He's playing a character who is not. He could he could have been the drift guy in the original movie, but he wasn't. He no, he's the he's the bigger muscle car guy than Dominic Toretto is. So, also props for that. For going for a non-standard um, writing for that character, so props to Justin Lin for that. So anyway, point is, I, representation matters. Representation is good. Having more Asian representation, having more 
African-American representation, having a more Hispanic representation in film is good. And so when I saw Mulan and what they were doing with that, we were like, oh, this could be really awesome. And while the lead actress playing the title character said things in support of the of the Chinese crackdown in Hong Kong, in support of the of what's being done to the Uyghur minority population of Japan of um of China, I for the same reasons I mentioned earlier with um Sishin Liu went okay. But she also lives in China. She has she has to live there, and she and she. It's not like it's oh I'm saying these things and then also Disney's getting me like U.S. Cit helping me get U.S. citizenship so I can like defect and let my family out of the country so that after I've said these things I don't have to worry about the people I care about getting hurt for it. So, like, again, it's one thing to say something, to, to say, to, to speak out in support of a minority population, to speak out against injustice when it is just you at risk. It is something else. We, I, I understand the concerns and the things that cause people, give people pause when it's themselves and their family who are at risk. And it's not that their family doesn't support what they're saying. It's that their family cannot protect themselves necessarily in the same way that they can that they may have a degree of privilege that will protect them, but does not protect their family um, from negative repercussions from a government or from, from a government for speaking out against injustice. So I, again, that, that's kind of, <clears throat> that's again, that's the first part of the, of the video in a sentence. But... Then there's the fact that Disney shot in the area where the Uyghur are being persecuted and cracked down on with the full support in, of the Chinese government. Now, admittedly, you can't shoot in China without the support of the Chinese government, but with a level of assistance that what, that is gross, I will say, that is closer to turning a blind eye. It's, to make another comparison to work of problematic art, um, there's the Paul Simon album Graceland, and which, good album, and came about from Paul Simon, along with several other artists, going to South Africa during apartheid in violation of the boycott. The thing is, with what Paul Simon was doing, and what makes that different from Mulan, is Paul Simon was going to South Africa to work creatively with black, with, with, with black South Africans, with the population who was being persecuted by apartheid. By comparison, this is Disney working with the Chinese government's full support in areas where the Chinese government is persecuting a minority population, and is not doing this in a way to support where, where they can take advantage of this in any way to support the local the, the population that's being um so they're being persecuted either covertly or overtly which is kind of gross because disney is in the position like of all the film studios disney's in a position where they can say well worst case scenario china Washing my hands. I can, like, we're writing off the Chinese box office. It's nice to have, but we can get along without it. Disney can do that more than Sony, more than Warner Brothers, more than anybody else can. They are in the best possible position to say, yeah, we, like, the Chinese box office is a huge deal. The, like, Chinese cinemas are the second largest market in the world. But, if China kicks us out because we aren't cool with what's going on with Uyghur, we're not cool with what's going on with Hong Kong, we're not cool with how China treats um, LGBTQ populations, um, that's fine. We're freaking Disney. 
So that is gross. That is unfortunate. And that is disappointing. And I am, and it is a situation that also, like the people who were making the movie were in a position, like were in a position to act on this in terms of the director could very easily have said, no, maybe not. Like, could have said, hey, we don't want to shoot in this part of the country. If nothing else, they could say, it doesn't reflect the, the, the landscape that we actually want for the film. Can we shoot over here? Um, instead, they had options, and they did not take them. So, with that in mind, I will not be viewing or reviewing Mulan, the live-action film in this channel. As a person who likes martial arts movies a great deal, who likes wuxia films a great deal, um, that film is one that I had been looking forward to and I will not be watching. I understand it has also received some, a significant degree of criticism from um, Asian American, particularly Chinese American um, creative um, people, from film critics and writers and that sort of thing, and those criticisms are valid. But that alone, like, on their own, I would have been if there hadn't been the other problems going on, it would have been, oh, I'm going to take these remarks in, con in, in mind when I go down to sit down to watch the movie anyway. And brought that up and discussed the film in the context of those remarks and that sort of thing. But this is different. This is... Um, this is a degree of complicity that I am not comfortable with with the film that I'm watching, reviewing. And the last point when it comes to works from problematic creatives and created through problematic means. And that is related to works of the past. And I will... How to put this? And again, there's two different sides here. There is the there is the creatives who are problematic, and then there's the works created through problematic means. I'm going to cover the first one first. And this is getting in the territory of, I'm going to describe it as two different big-name authors. Big-name historical authors. And that is your Howard Phillips Lovecrafts and your Marion Zimmer Bradleys. This is going to be a long video, but that's okay. So, Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Lovecraft, I have managed to actually refrain from cussing a great deal in this video, so it's time to break that trend. Lovecraft was racist as fuck. Racist, homophobic, anti-Semitic, uh, probably also pretty misogynist too. Uh, he's, if, like, if you look into his personal actual views, he's a nasty piece of work. And he like, he, he wrote with a lot of people, and, a lot, and some of them called him on that bullshit. In particular, um... Robert E. Howard, you know, creator of Conan the Mighty Thude Barbarian, uh, he called like, like he called HBL out on this run the regular, and they were good buds, and even that like they, they corresponded very frequently. And Howard like, dude, Robert E. Howard basically, if you go through his letters, like, dude, dude, what the fuck? So I'm gonna adjust my. I'm, my volume just a little bit because I'm pegging the needle. Um, sorry about that. So, yeah, lots of <laughs> so, yeah, low crap, racist as fuck. Also, dead. Also, everything he wrote is in the public domain. So, like, supporting his uh, so, if you buy a collection of HP Lovecraft stuff, it ain't supporting his estate because. One, he didn't really have much of an estate. Two, it's actually basically supporting whoever the publisher is. It's Galance or something else or that sort of thing. So, and that actually has led to a great deal of other opportunities for creative people, particularly people of color, to engage and do works in conversation with the Cthulhu mythos, with the works of Howard Phillips Lovecraft. And that's how we get things like Lovecraft Country. Among many other things, you have authors like uh, K. Jemison who are writing stuff in um, dialogue with Lovecraft. Others who I completely are looking. You have the Harlem Unbound source book for Call of Cthulhu. Tons of stuff. So, 
as far as Lovecraft goes, buying a collection of Lovecraft stories isn't going to actively support, financially support a, a person who, individual who holds racist views and who is going to use that money towards racist ends, unless you are we're talking about, say, a collection of Lovecraft stories published by Castelia House and where Theodore Beale is going to use that money to support Gamergate and support um, the rabid puppies and use that money to drive people of color and women out of science fiction and fantasy. Fuck that guy. So, like, in fact, actually, if we got, like, a collection of Lovecraft stories from, written with essays from people, from authors of color, of horror people talking about of women and of LGBTQ people discussing the themes in the story, like, Lovecraft's problems with these stories and calling it calling out the racism and homophobia within the works, along with having the works there so you can like read the essay, read the original story, and get what's going on there. I'd like I'd buy that in a heartbeat. Add that oh, and a cut of this is going to NAACP, if it's going to um uh, transgender charities, it's going to rain, it's going to uh bail funds or whatever, I I will buy that. I will buy that. If that exists, I will buy that right now. Um, like, no, seriously. Like, shut up and take my money. But, in any case, there's that. Um, but, so, in the case of Lovecraft, that's fine. Similarly, Marion Zimmer Bradley. Marion Zimmer Bradley gets more complicated than Lovecraft. Lovecraft's a clear-cut case of a nasty person who holds nasty views, who is stone dead, um, and all his work is in the public domain because it's that old. It, it predates the it predates Steamboat Willie, so go at it. Mary Zimmer Bradley gets more complicated because her work is not in the public domain. Mary Zimmer Bradley is a woman who is part of kind of a big push in the 1960s and 70s of women getting into science fiction and writing science fiction and fantasy under their own names rather than writing them under a male pen name, like, for example, Andre Norton in the past. And, like, and Anne McCaffrey was another big part of this. And Bradley and Anne McCaffrey played a very large role in promoting lots of women's work, of doing collaborative piece stories with other women authors, of with, for example, with Bradley doing her um, Dark Over shared universe project and using that to promote other women uh, writing. Bradley edited numerous magazines and used that position to get women published. Awesome, like, she did a lot of awesome work there, and she sexually abused a lot of sexually abused people, used that position to sexually assault people, including children, including her own children, um, at science fiction conventions, and elsewhere. She covered for her husband, Walter Breen, who was con who was a pedophile, um, convicted pedophile who went to jail. He was a, also a founder of NAMBLA. Um, like, very nasty person. Very, un like, very dangerous, honestly, person. Both of, both of them are also dead. And for the, and a lot of the people who, whose work was sponsored and promoted by Marion Zimmer Bradley in this case, did not know what Marion Zimmer Bradley was doing until after, well long after she had died and long after their careers had gotten a significant gain. Like after they've st their careers had been established in their own rights. And so the question, and thankfully, or the case of Marion Zimmer Bradley, when these allegations came out, particularly those from Bradley's daughter, her publisher, who's in charge of her estate right now, a glance, basically did the right thing and said, we are taking all of our royalties that we're getting from Marion Zimmer Bradley's works and we're donating them to charities that are helping deal with child sexual abuse. Basically, using the money that any money that's coming in from Marion Zimmer Bradley's work to 
address the harm, the, the kind of harm that she caused, which is the right thing. And similarly, the woman who has taken over writing the Avalon novels, um, the follow-ups after the Aaron Zimmer Bradley's Mist of Avalon series, um, is donating her proceeds to Rain, which again, work for the same reason and for doing the right thing. And where this, all of this comes up to stuff that I previously reviewed is another person who has been sim, who has similar allegations in their past is David Eddings. David Eddings um, wrote the Belgariad, which I have previously reviewed on this channel, and back like way back when I got started, and was on um, back when Blip.tv was still a thing. You had alternative places where you could go to post videos, uh, place review videos on the internet, and earn money doing so. Crazy, I know, right? So, David Eddings and his wife, Lee, also were charged with having committed sexual assault, I believe also against minors. And this was back in the 1970s, this is well before the, uh, like the Belgiriad and the Pelgora series and um, various other similar books had also been written. So before he, they'd really gotten heavily established as authors of uh, fantasy fiction. So, um, both of them have also since passed on, and their literary legacy has gone to Reed College, which was um, Eddings' alma mater, but who also, when Eddings was charged, the then dean at the time cover, um, kind of covered for him, which makes the question of supporting David Eddings' work a little more awkward on the one hand a lot like the people responsible for that choice are probably no longer at reed college anymore in fact they probably either retired or or have passed on particularly since they're probably in a position like the people in question were older than david eddings at the time on that side and on the and similarly the revenues from the sale of david eddings books are likely going to go to, uh, or uh, not likely, have been established that they're going to provide scholarship programs for um, lower-income people and that sort of thing. And then for that matter, it's also a case of a, these books sold really well, they're very common used. So addressing future works by David Eddings, I feel okay about about other works there David Eddings and David and Lee Eddings aren't doing any more harm they can't do any more harm they're dead and for, and the, for that matter if I decide to discuss Marion Zimmer Bradley's works or a Dark Over series I feel more comfortable doing that knowing that the money that those works that, that any monies that come from sales of those works aren't going are going to organizations that are trying to address the harm that she caused in life. Or the harm like the kind she caused in life, not the direct harm. But, again, by comparison, there is, for example, this little film that gets referenced a lot in popular culture and is a very widely regarded psychological thriller called The Usable Suspects. It stars Kevin Spacey, who is a, a sex pest, actually assaulted people, was charged for doing so. Um, the director of the film, also a sex pest, also charged for doing so. So, and everybody, and the main people involved in that film, uh, the, the people in question, are still alive and still in a position to financially profit from their work. Um, and also for that matter, getting back to J.K. Rowling being raging transphobe and... Poison Scott Card, Raging Homophobe, etc., etc. Not supporting those, like, if it's a work who is, if it's a, who is, um, or the creator was a bigot or a sexual abuser and is, unre uh, has, does not, uh, not atoned and will not atone for doing so, and that, fun that the financial benefits from partaking in their creative work Will can permit them to continue to harm other people. 
that is a situation where I am 100% okay with not supporting that creator and not supporting that work, not just in terms of financially, but also in terms of because with my channel, I run ads or other I do, um, well, uh, affiliate links for the works that I discuss. Um, I don't feel comfortable discussing those works again going forward. So you're not going to see me reviewing a Kevin Spacey movie on this channel at any point in the future. And I'm not going to be discussing other similar creatives a while until they've, again, either taken clear steps to atone or are no longer around to benefit from my discuss from my discussion of those works. So that covers those bases there. I put in my apologies for this being a long-winded video, but this is not a breezy topic by any stretch of the imagination. It is a, it is a serious matter, and I figure it's important to lay these things out, not to be pithy or quippy about it any more than I already have been. Not doing video, not no clips, no memes, no on-camera stuff that I would normally do for a more conventional video essay. This is something where I feel it's important to just talk and leave it at that. Next time, so this is a week when I normally would have been doing a Batman review, and I will be having my regularly scheduled Batman review next week. So you can look forward to the proper start of Nightfall. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.